Um, my name is, um, let me see if I can figure out what I need to do. My name is Philip Kufeld. I'm a technologist with uh, Seagate Technology. I work in their research department, specifically um, we are in the what we call the data flow pillar, where we study you know the effects of moving data around the ecosystem, right? And what are the costs and what are the expenses? And so computational storage naturally fits in that space, right? Because we, with computational storage, uh, we are trying to figure out ways to not move the data as much and not incur those expenses of moving data. So that's my focus is on HDD computational storage. And I was just talking a few minutes ago that I'm, I think I'm the lone ranger. Uh, I don't believe anybody else is working on HDDs and computational storage. Um, but uh, we are at Seagate. Uh, I am directing two different external re research projects at Seagate. I have one with uh, the Human Cell Atlas, which is a uh, University of California uh, Santa Cruz project where they're taking large data set of genomic information and they're doing you know, research against that and they need to periodically, almost multiple times a day, scan very large data sets. You know, when I say large data sets, I'm talking about hundreds to petabyte uh, of data. And so moving that kind of stuff into a CPU to do those scans is very expensive and so they're looking at computational storage as a way of alleviating that. Um, I'm also working with uh, Los Alamos National Labs uh, uh, for their campaign storage uh, project where they're doing very similar things. They, they have very large data sets. One experiment can be petabytes. And they need to uh, ask it questions, that data questions periodically. And they don't want to move it all the way up into their expensive high performance uh, compute environment to do that. So they're looking at using computational storage as a way of asking simple questions of the data to determine if it makes sense to move it back into the high performance cloud. Um, I am going to get into computer architecture, CPU architecture issues in this presentation. I am not a CPU architect, and I am not an expert. I just play one on TV, I guess. Um, I did reread my Hennessy and Patterson, though, to refresh myself with what was really going on in these CPUs. Uh, but uh, you know, if you get too deep, you're going to lose me, but uh, with questions. Uh, but, uh, and then the other thing is all of this stuff comes from public information or my own personal experiments. Um, I'm not using any uh, internal understanding of ARM or anything like that. It's just what I've been able to determine from the outside looking in. So my computational storage is based on a uh, research platform that we have at Seagate. Uh, it's called the Envoy Interposer card, and it is a small PCB that slides on the front of a SATA device. So that's a normal SATA, 16 terabyte SATA hard drive right there, and you can see there's this really thin PCB that plugs into the SATA port, and on that PCB, uh, we have a, an ARM core, you know, an A53 ARM uh, processor. It's a dual core running at a gigahertz. Uh, it's got uh, 32K of L1 instruction and data cache, and it's only got 256K of L2 cache. So it's a, it's a very small processor. Um, but ARM did put uh, all of the uh, SIMD floating point stuff in the A53. So I do have that at my disposal. And we're going to talk about SIMD later on because it, it plays into this. Um, we have one gigabit, uh, gigabyte of uh, DDR4 running at 800 megahertz. It's only a 16-bit wide bus uh, uh, on this particular SOC. So when, when I start talking about performance problems, that was my first, oh, it's got to be the memory subsystem. A little bit of foreshadowing, it's not. Um, uh, we also have some NOR flash. But the other thing is that it's a 2.5, dual 2.5 gigabit interfaces. Um, so on the other side of the ARM, uh, uh, Envoy card, you see that connector there? That connector is a SAS connector, and it is compliant to the SFF 9689 uh, uh, spec, which allows for Ethernet to be out the front of that. So that's actually a full-blown server. It's got dual NICs on the front end, uh, uh, storage on the back end, and, and internal memory. Uh, it runs Ubuntu uh, 2004 with a 516 kernel, and I'm using it for both uh, the HCA and the uh, campaign storage tier uh, research. So 
when I first started playing with this, you know, the first thing you do is you start doing benchmarking of that Envoy card. You know, it, what is it capable of doing? You do all the standard sort of things that you do, right? You run FIO, you run iPerf, you determine, you know, can that CPU provide the network bandwidth that you have, right? I got dual 2.5 gig ethernets. Uh, I've got a SATA drive on the back end. Is, is the Envoy going to be the bottleneck? And so doing these standard benchmarks, it, it, the A53 is perfectly fine for doing 255 megabytes per second of throughput to the drive, so the drives are the bottleneck, right? It's not the Envoy. So that's good news. The Envoy is capable of supporting that. And on the Ethernet side, uh, if I only use one core, I can get 250 megabytes per second out of the interface. Um, if I use both cores, I can get all 2.5 gigs out of the interfaces as well. So it's, again, it's not Envoy restricting me. It's the actual uh, uh, infrastructure around Envoy that, that is, which is what we want to see, right? I want to be able to see that I can pull 255 megabytes of data from the network and put it onto the drive without any bottlenecks in between. And that's what these, these initial benchmarks were showing me. So we're like, oh, good, everything's good. Then we started doing computational functions in the HCA. And that's when we started to first get our hints of problems. We saw the computational functions themselves showing application performance problems. And that's where we're going to dive into today. We're going to look at those, those, those problems and what causes them. So a little bit of background, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, the function that uh, uh, the HCA was doing is they were calculating uh, a T statistic for these data sets, right? So I have a big matrix, and it turns out in the genomics world it's a 25,000 column matrix and then N number of rows. And what they want to do is they want to calculate a T statistic over that so that they can compare one data set to the other and see how similar they are. And so T statistic is basically the you know sample variance and uh, 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 standard deviation, and there's a well-known al algorithm, Welford's, that allow you to essentially iterate over your matrix and calculate uh, your means and your mean squares so that you can get to your sample variation and, and your uh, standard deviation. So these three lines are essentially the bulk of the work that my computational function has to do. It has to actually go out there and calculate this uh, T statistic, and that's what it's doing, iterating over a very large number of columns to, to calculate this. And so this is where uh, you know, we started to see problems. And by the way, the, um, the data set is doubles. They're not singles. They're, they're double floating point precision. Um, so I'm operating on 64-bit uh, 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 entities when I'm doing this. Uh, the computational storage function, though, when you think about it, so if you're thinking about computational storage functions, I have some data that's on the drive, and it's named in some way. In this case, it's key value. So I have one megabyte worth of that table. So you can con conceive of having 25,000 columns, and I've got n number of rows that will fit in a megabyte. And that is a sub part of the data. And I can now distribute that across many hard drives, different portions of the data set, and I can independently calculate these things and compare them um, and uh, come up with a comparison that gets uh, essentially uh, aggregated at the host to determine the actual outcome. But each individual function is working on like just a megabyte key value. And to do that, I have data layout issues. In this case, it's Apache Arrow, so I have to run Apache Arrow uh, code in my function to essentially read and interpret and get it into memory so that I can, I can run this algorithm against it. Um, there's a lot of pieces and parts to that computational function, but this is the meat of the function. So what I wanted to do uh, when I saw that I was having application performance problems was essentially recreate the thing that was causing me the problem, which was uh, the uh, actual t-statistic. So I created a small program to isolate the t-statistic code so that I could run it uh, you know, with, uh, uh, with various changing various parameters to try to understand what was causing the problem, right? So I've got you know, this program where I can say the size of my matrix, I can tell you how many runs I want to do so that I can calculate uh, an average number of uh, how long it takes to run uh, one, one iteration. I can assign it a core. If I want to see if it behaves differently on one core from the other core, I can do that. 
Um, and I can play around with, uh, is, it, is it a problem because I'm using doubles, or is, could I get better performance if I'm using floats, that kind of stuff. So this is the, essentially the basis for my performance work, is this little recreation program. And uh, I wanted to compare between Intel and my Envoy. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to see what is uh, the performance ratio between running it on the host. So today's world, if I want to run the same thing, I'm going to load all the data into the host, and I'm going to run this algorithm on the host itself. So that's my Neon, I mean my uh, uh, Intel. And then in the computational storage world, I'm going to run it on the Envoy. So I want to compare those two because I want to see what's the ratio. In other words, how many envoys will I need to replace a core in Intel world, right? Because that's the sort of fundamental question here is if it takes me uh, 50 uh, computational storage drives to replace one core, the, the cost benefits problem is not there, right? I'm, I'm putting a lot of added cost that I could just add another core up at the uh, host level and, and deal with these issues. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, uh, that ratio. Um, and I'm also compiling with uh, Big O3. And I don't know if you're, if you're not familiar with the you know, compiler optimizations, but the third level of optimization will uh, potentially let you take advantage of hardware features such as SIMD, right? So doing single instruction, multiple data, where you have vectored operations and things like that, if your code's written right, Big O3 will, will uh, take advantage of that. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And uh, so this is just basically how simple the program is. It's very simple, doing the Welford algorithm, you know, doing some initialization, and then running through all of the columns, calculating the, uh, the means and the mean squared. SIMD, if you're not familiar with SIMD, this is uh, the vector operations that are pretty much in all modern CPUs nowadays. Uh, they allow you to essentially do multiple operations with a single instruction, right? So uh, if I want to multiply two floating points together, um, I can do it with a single instruction using SIMD. But it means that I have to load those reg uh, these very wide registers. In this case, uh, on ARM, they're 128-bit. I think on Intel, they go as high as 512, maybe even higher. Um, and in the world of doubles, that means that I can put two doubles into 128 bits. I can put the other two doubles in another 128-bit register, and then with one instruction, multiply them, and I get the results for both, uh, both of them with a single instruction. So that's the big advantage. The other thing is, is that it, there's uh, uh, complex instructions called multiply and accumulate that it turns out a lot of times you want to multiply um, two numbers together and add them to a total, right? And that is so common and so prevalent that there are instructions that do this for you, right? They're multiply, accumulate instructions. So now with SIMD, I'm now getting four instructions for the price of one because I can load these registers up and get two operands being multiplied and added together with one instruction. So SIMD is a, a very powerful tool for improving uh, the overall performance of, of your code. But you have to write your code in such a way that this is possible. And this is one of the lessons I learned. I'd never done SIMD programming before this exercise. And I learned very quickly, you trade off memory for performance, um, meaning things like you have to make sure your, your data is in contiguous memory locations. So uh, instead of allocating you know, a bunch of rows for your matrix, since I'm wanting to calculate across the columns, I have to make sure that my allocations are that uh, adjacent columns are next to each other so that the C compiler can automatically generate this code. Another, another tip is the uh, use of local variables, small local variables, like if you have a transient result that you're keeping, uh, you can't just keep that in a, in a scalar. You, you need to do that in some sort of an array so that the compiler can take multiple iterations of your loop and put them into a single instruction set. So. And then this is stupid and this simple, but I can't tell you how valuable it is to me because I'm constantly making changes to my algorithm because I'm, I'm tweaking it, I'm changing it. Oh, I need to uh, allocate my arrays differently. Oh, what if I do this instruction or that instruction? 
Having the ability to double check the results of your calculation to make sure it's still accurate, extremely important, because nothing worse than having great performance numbers on an inaccurate function, right? Uh, and so being able to take small amounts of data and just copy and paste it into Excel and have it immediately tell you if your algorithm is correct is an invaluable tool. I can't tell you how many times I would thought that I did it right. And then those ones on the side over there were zeros. They were saying, nope, you, your algorithm is giving you bad data. So being able to know whether or not there's good data or bad data, this, this is just an invaluable way of doing it. So let's get to some of the analysis. So I, like I said, I wanted to compare this uh, between Intel and the uh, Envoy itself. And, and my first feeling, like I said at the beginning, was that we have a 16-bit memory bus. And we have always attributed any performance problems to the fact that we're just not able to get memory into the system fast enough. And that's what we've always assumed. And when we did this, uh, this work, we showed that, that it turns out that is not the problem in this environment. Um, when we run it on Xeon, it's taking about 86 milliseconds to do, uh, uh, to do these thousand runs with a, a one megabyte size of data. But on the Envoy, it was taking over two seconds, which is like a 25x delta. And if you had asked me before I ran this, I would say, you know, uh, the, the processors are four times slower, right? Because it's a four gigahertz comparing to a one gigahertz. So, you know, maybe it's six, seven times slower. I never anticipated it would be 25 times slower. And I'm like, what is going on here? And when I look at the memory going, okay, so it must be a memory problem. Look at the L1 cache, decache misses. We're not getting any misses. So that's not the problem. We're not waiting, installing, waiting for memory to come into the CPU. There's some other problem. And the big problem is that other red highlighted area. Today, our, all of our processes, processors are pretty much all superscalar processes, processors that are able to do multiple instructions per second, per cycle, right? And uh, so you would expect that number to be greater than one. And as a matter of fact, on the Intel side, they're getting almost 3.6 instructions per cycle. They're cranking through this stuff. And as a matter of fact, their L1 cache misses, I believe, it's because it is operating so fast that the, in, the instruction processing is getting ahead of the decache fills, right, and getting ahead of it. So it is getting uh, decache misses. But we're running so slow we're never facing that problem. And it's because of that 0.44. We're not even getting in an instruction per cycle on this, in this environment. So now we gotta figure out why is that, right? It's not a branching problem, it's not a, a L1 problem, it's literally a pipeline problem. Why are we stalling the pipeline so badly? And so that's where uh, I ended up having to go, try to figure that out. So I extended the, uh, uh, the recreation tool that I was using, that little program. Instead of just operating on doubles with C code, I decided, well, let, let's see if it's the optimizer. Let's see if, I'm, I, you know, if I wrote this stuff in SIMD code specifically. So uh, every processor that has SIMD in it, the corresponding GCC has some sort of intrinsics uh, for SIMD that you can write explicit SIM, SIMD code and not depend on the optimizer. Uh, to do the conversion for you. So that was my first, first attempt, was to go ahead and write that SIMD code directly. Turns out it's pretty similar to the optimizer, uh, which goes to the adage, you know, the odds of you ever out optimizing the optimizer are pretty low. Those guys do that for a living and that's all they do day in and day out. Lionel may have different views on that, but from us mere mortals, I don't, I don't know that I would ever do better than a, uh, uh, the C optimizer. So I said, all right, so it's not uh, the optimizer. Let's go look at the instructions specifically. Let's, let's do an implementation directly in assembly and then, see, and then try to quantify uh, what the effects of individual instructions are to the pipeline, to the overall instruction per cycle count. So uh, I then went and wrote uh, an assembly version. I'm gonna show that in detail here in a minute because it's important. Um, and it's definitely slower because my unoptimized loop is nowhere near what a C code optimized loop. As a matter of fact, when you look, I did a lot of disassembly through this entire process. So like you would take your code, unoptimize it, disassemble it, and you go, oh, that's my code. I recognize that. I can see the assembly instructions of everything I'm doing in C. I do 03, 
I don't recognize that code. I have no idea what they're doing. It's, it's two times longer, but it's doing, uh, doing stuff that I don't quite understand. So um, not, not shocking that my assembler version is slower, but it gives me a vehicle to look in detail at the instructions. Um, how do I do this? I, again, this is me trying to share some tools with you guys. Uh, using extended uh, assembler in uh, C is very powerful. It allows you to combine C code with assembly, so I can do all of my allocations in C. I don't have to rewrite all that stuff. I can just allocate matrices and all of that crap. And then with the extended uh, nomenclature for C, for assembly, I can reference uh, those symbolically in my assembly code. So I don't have to actually know the register that the optimizer chose to put it in. I can, uh, with a name, reference variables that are in C in my assembly code. So it's very powerful. Encourage you, if you ever get to the point where you're writing assembly, to look at this because it really will shorten your development cycle out. So, so you can see uh, there's C code up here that's doing the uh, loop, and I'm depending on the C optimizer to optimize the loop layout. But inside of that loop, the real work is actually this ASM, uh, extended GCC ASM code. And you can see at the bottom, here I can walk over to it. At the bottom is where you identify the C variables and things of that nature that you're gonna reference in your code. And then you can actually reference them directly in your code without having to know the register. And in this case, I'm actually using a SIMD register. So I can, I can use SIMD registers, I can use regular registers, it doesn't matter, the code, the code will figure it all out. So you'll notice I have the comments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. These are, this is the entire Welford uh, algorithm uh, in these 11 in, uh, stages, I call them stages, and they're kind of broken up. It turns out that the first pass, the first, what is it, uh, seven uh, instructions are ALU instructions. In other words, they're just doing CPU to CPU. They're doing, re you know, doing shifts and adds of, of uh, things in the CPU and the regular register. I mean, in the regular registers, and they're not loading anything from memory. So these are kind of equivalent operations. They're all doing CPU type of operations. So this is what I call stage one. And then you can notice when I get over to two, three, and four, these are memory ops. So these are loads. I'm loading data from memory into registers. And then five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, are all the uh, SIMD or floating point operations, right? So this is the, the divs and the adds and the, I even have a multiply and accumulate here, that's what this is. Um, and so, and then the last two are storing my results, put them back in, into memory, right? Um, what this allows me to do is I can now do conditional compiles. I can say, give me a binary with just stage one in it. Then give me a binary with stage one and stage two. Then give me a binary with stage one, two, and three. And I can do that for all the stages, and then I can look at the instruction cycle, uh, instructions per cycle for each one of those binaries and see how it impacts that instruction per cycle count. So that's just me explaining it more. And the other thing is I also had other examples of A53. I have a small board computer called a Rock Pro gives me another A53, I have a Raspberry Pi, which is an A72, and uh, one of my compile servers is an A72, 16-core uh, A72, but it allows me to test other architectures to see and compare uh, the same strategy with. So there you go, here's the data. So when I look at this, I start off and I'm getting superscalar behavior on both the A53 and A72. If you, the, the chart itself over there, red is A53, green is A50, A72. Um, and you can see they behave very differently. Um, but I start off with a superscalar result, but then quickly, um, as I do my loads, my memory operations, I'm falling off the chart. My average is dropping, right? So loads are a problem here, right? Because uh, I'm getting less and less uh, super scalar behavior. I'm dropping to below a half of uh, an instruction per, per cycle. And then even the uh, floating point is a problem. Even though that drop doesn't look that big, relative to the previous number, it is a big number. It's like a 20% drop from 50 to 0.4 or whatever, right? There's a big drop in the floating point. So the floating point is a problem as well. 
Um, and there's a clear division. So I know that the pipelines in the A53 are very different than the pipelines in the A72, right? Because I'm getting much different results for the A72. And again, the Envoy 16-bit DDR bus is not the big culprit. It is the pipelines. And uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. Is that all, everybody following this? Okay. So doing some research, you can get some public information about pipelines. So the A53, um, this is uh, essentially a two wide, so they can essentially load two instructions at a time, decode them, and issue them at two at a time, but it's in order, which means that uh, again, this is where we start to get to whether or not I'm a CPU expert or not, but it means basically that you can't do them out of order. You can't, you have to wait for the completion of one before the other. Um, at least ones that share resources. Um, and then the big issues here is take a look at this middle box right here. AGU stands for address generation unit. So all loads and stores go through that one, one component. So immediately I'm losing all superscalar behavior for loads and stores because I have to funnel all the instructions through a single resource. Normally with a normal pipeline, especially out of order pipelines, you're gonna have multiple of those so that you can process multiple loads and stores simultaneously. And then uh, the neon, you can see that there, because it's floating point, it's gonna be a much longer unit for how long it takes to process the individual commands. What I can't tell you from here and from the pictures I've seen on the, on the net is whether or not there are differences between those units. It turns out there can be differences between individual units inside the pipeline. Like they may decide to only do divides in one FPU uh, unit and not do them in the other. So if I have multiple divides happening, they're gonna all funnel through one of these boxes. Uh, instead of being distributed across multiple resources. So the A72 is an example of a more modern pop pipeline. And by the way, there, there's nothing wrong with that previous pipeline, right? Those decisions were made because of a lot of different factors. They want to save power, right? This is a low-end processor. They're trying to find a sweet spot for managing a couple of external devices and other things of that nature. Um, and they're gonna trade off things like uh, silicon real estate for power. There's a whole bunch of trade-offs they're gonna make. And so the way it's laid out is specifically for specific sweet spots and use cases. The question is, is that a computational storage sweet spot or use case? And, and what I'm coming to the conclusion is, is no, the A53 is probably not. Um, A72, you can see now we have multiple address generation units. That's why you don't see the drop in, in loads and stores in the A72 line, right? If we go back, uh, let's see if I can go back. You see that there it actually gets a small bump in uh, instructions per cycle on the A72 uh, when you get into the loads and stores and then it drops off for the floating point numbers. But the reason for that is they have multiple address uh, generation units uh, in the A72. It's also an out of order pipeline. So they don't, they don't, they're not dependent on previous instructions. They can do them out of order um, uh, and uh, this, I think, does have an asymmetric uh, floating point processor. I think the divide is in the top, top box, and I think there is no divide in the bottom one. So I think there is some funneling of instructions in that space. All right, so this is part of my journey, right? I've been kind of telling you a story of how I got to this point. Well, after I did this presentation once, I went back and looked at my data and I went, Wait a minute, when I was running this thing, I was running this with zero filled data. I, did, I had the wrong option on my little accumulate program because my accumulate program allows me to zero fill the matrix or put random data in the matrix. And I had run those previous graphs with zero filled data. Look what happens to the A72 line with, uh, zero filled data, with non zero filled, with actual data in the matrices and not zeros. Basically, stage six causes me to fall off the planet, right? Because evidently they have an optimization in their pipe pipeline for a zero numerator when I do my divides and they just go, oh, nothing to do here, move on. And uh, now that I have data in there, I'm dropping way off the planet with that. So uh, 
So I had to rerun all my graphs, and that's when I found out that FDiv is a problem, right? FDiv is the issue here. I also had a small flaw in uh, how I was calculating some averages. It didn't really make meaningful changes to the data, but I did detect that and change it and move forward. So back to FDiv. So I start talking to my CPU guy. I mean, we design CPUs and pipelines at Seagate. So I, I call up the, the, the guru, and he's like, why are you doing a divide? Nobody does divides. Why are you doing that? That's dumb. And, and uh, he said, they're, they're never optimized because they require, uh, they, they really can't be. They, they, they occupy huge amounts of real estate. That's why only one of these floating point units has a divide in it, because they require extra silicon to do it, um, requires extra power. Um, and if you really look at the optimizer, again, remember when I said I didn't recognize my code after GCC? If, when I really went and looked at that, they got rid of my divide. The optimizer did. So uh, I said, oh, I need to fix that. So instead of dividing, uh, where I do the divide is based upon, as I'm creating these averages, this running average, I have to weight the new contribution to the average based upon how many iterations I have already done. So if I'm at column 10, and I'm gonna look at the difference between the average and this current data, I have to take that difference and divide it by the number of columns so that I weight it properly and put it into the average correctly. Um, and so why can't I just multiply by the inverse? Calculate the inverse once before the main loop and then just multiply by that uh, inverse from that point forward. And you can see what happens to the graph. Uh, it actually makes the A72 much better than it was previously. So I'm, I'm with the A52, A72, I'm getting over 1.5 instructions per cycle. Why don't, why don't you have the active problem in the 53? Because the A53 always has a problem because I don't think it has the optimization for zero filled data. I think it's, I think it's actually doing a divide with the zero operand. Yeah, yeah it looks like if you did both two on the A53, you still would have got so I did get a little bit of improvement on the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the A53. There's a little bit of an improvement. It's like a half an instruction. So it did improve it, but uh, not dramatically. And there's another, I'm coming to another interesting feature of the A53 coming up now, because now, remember I showed you I had one multiply and accumulate in the Welford algorithm? Now that I put that multiply instead of the divide, guess what? I, multiply by the inverse and then add it to the running mean. So I have another opportunity for another multiply and accumulate in this algorithm. So I got interested into whether or not the uh, multiply and accumulate actually provide any benefit. So this was me replacing the uh, uh, divide with an inverse. And uh oh, what happened? So I decided to look at multiply and accumulate and see what benefit I got by using a multiply accumulate command versus a multiply and then an, and an add instruction. So I re rewrote the code to uh, decompose those into either two instructions or one instruction, right? Uh, and it turns out with the A53, it doesn't matter. If I use the multiply and accumulate instruction or I do a multiply and then an add instruction, I get the exact same results, which tells me they don't have a multiply and accumulate instruction. They're degenerating it into two instructions inside the pipeline. Uh, on the A72, guess what? We get, we get a benefit. We get 13 to 14% benefit by using the multiply and accumulate. So what are my conclusions? Well, first of all, 25x is too big for computational storage. If I have to tell you that you have to put in 25 devices for every core that you want to replace, that's not, that's not a good value. Um, I need to get that number way down. I, and I, right now, I'm, I'm using just a in the air type of where the wind blows. I'm looking for something around 5, 6x uh, to do that. Um, and so it means that the A53 is not going to be capable of doing that. And I, I do want to do a caveat here that uh, I am doing floating point in this, so I'm probably getting some of the worst performance that I can get. 
um, out of this, but the load and store side of things tells me I've got a generalized problem with the A53 for, for computational storage functions, even if I don't use uh, floating point in my computational storage function. So, um, so the A53 is probably not sufficient for doing computational storage functions. Uh, and interestingly enough, we, it's been a common platform. If you go out and look at other vendors that are doing computational storage function, especially on NAND and Flash, you'll see A53s. Um, I think NGD, would, previously before they, uh, they went away, they had an A53 in their ASIC. They were using an A53 core. So um, I, think, I think the lesson here is that people doing computational storage functions should be looking at more modern architectures, something like an A55 or an A A76, some of the new ones that are coming out right now, and we need to find SOCs that do that. Um, I also want to do, uh, mention that this took a lot of time, right? I spent a lot of time iterating through this, trying to understand what was going on, and Joe Blow, who's doing computational storage functions, is not going to want to do this, right? So finding a compromise between cost and power is going to be critical for adoption, in my opinion, right? Because I want something that generally will work OK and will not present problems that force this kind of analysis, right? If you have to optimize your code down to the assembly, I don't think you're going to get big adoption for computational storage functions, right? Because not, they're not, people don't have the expertise, and they're not going to want to do that kind of thing. So we have to find that balance between added cost and ease of use. Um, and so that's one of the things that uh, kind of gave me some insights uh, moving forward for how I'm going to pick what the new Envoy is going to look like, is a couple of those factors. And yeah, the FPU implementations are important. You know, just because you have a Mac doesn't mean you have a Mac. You know, just because they say they gave you a multiply and accumulate doesn't mean they gave you a multiply and accumulate. And those can happen all over the place, right? Loads and stores going through a single address generation unit, it's problematic. And you need to do this analysis. I need to do this analysis before I create the next Envoy, right? Uh, this is something that never got done prior to us creating a PCB. We should have done this stuff long before we did that. And your usual suspects are not always the case, right? DDR bus was, everybody blamed our DDR bus and it had nothing to do with this. All right, I think that's it. I think that's what I've got for you today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer anything about the projects that I'm working on or, uh, uh, or any of the uh, any details that I didn't quite cover or you didn't quite understand. So, thank you. Sorry, I'm done early. I talked fast. <laughs>